Well, Merry Christmas. <laughs> or is it more Merry Stressmas? Because I know, for some of you at least, you have made nine kinds of cookies. You have probably hand rolled 300 chocolate truffles. I imagine that you have sent out dozens, if not hundreds, of Christmas cards of, of you know, you spent the time getting the picture, setting the trees. Now, the, today would have been a great picture-perfect Christmas card day, right? And uh, so I know you've done that. You've purchased, you've wrapped, you've shipped presents. And, of course, you're doing your best to keep up with Pinterest. I don't know what we did in this world without Pinterest. And all the gift ideas, I know that some of you have made little potpourri, and some of you had made little soap things that go to the teachers and this and that. We have a few teachers in the room. I imagine you've got a few Pinterest gifts this season. And all of those things kind of come together. And, you know, you've made the Nutter Butter Reindeer, one of my favorites, and... Uh, and uh, gingerbread houses that are perfect with the, the gumdrop wreaths and all those things. And, and after all, right, tis the season. But there are times in this season when things are not terribly peaceful. Even though at this time we talk about peace on earth, right, we still come to this place and we just go, ah, oh, right? Well, let me ask you, are you experiencing peace in your life? Maybe not just today, but in your life. Are you experiencing peace? Now, I imagine some of you at this time of the year are quick to respond to that and say, absolutely not. But it may not be just this time of the year. There may be other times in your lives, well, sometimes you feel like you have peace. Other times you don't feel like you have peace. And we have these self-imposed expectations of overstretched Christmas budgets and the expectation for more and more and more and more. And what is meant to be a time to reflect on the Prince of Peace, we come to this place of stress. But, as I said, it's not just the Christmas season. Our lives can be marked by times of peace and times of chaos and stress. We've been working through a series called Longing, and today we are, this morning we are looking at longing for peace. And we're looking at this in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 11, and Peter tells us in that verse, he says, seek peace and pursue it. We have to chase after peace. It's not like peace is something that comes naturally for most people. Originally, if you've been around for other messages in the series, you know that Peter has his audience was this first century, these first century believers who were in a time of persecution. And to those who were being persecuted, thrown to the lions, thrown into the gladiator arenas, and being lit on fire as tiki torches by night in Nero's garden, Peter says, seek peace and pursue it. It makes our Christmas season seem rather peaceful now, doesn't it? Now, here's the thing, is either Peter was just rather audacious to expect peace to be found at this time of their lives where they were facing persecution, or maybe he didn't mean it at all. Well, I'm inclined to believe that since he said it, he probably means it, that he assumed that what Peter said is what he meant, particularly since we have it included for us in God's Word, the Bible. So the other option is that if Peter meant to say, seek peace and pursue it, then maybe the peace that Peter is telling us to pursue and those first century believers to pursue is maybe not the, not the same peace that we sometimes think of what peace is. So when I ask you to think of peace, I think probably each of us has a mental picture in our head of what peace might be. Some of you maybe are thinking fuzzy pajamas, slippers, and a warm cup of hot cocoa in front of a fireplace. That's a picture of peace. Some of you maybe are thinking of a cool fall day walking through a forest or through the woods and the, the sound of leaves cracking beneath your feet. Maybe you have this picture of a horizon of snowfall on a farmstead and Maybe the sleigh out front, and that's a picture of peace. John Lennon, of course, maybe that's what you think of when you think of peace. Or tie-dye t-shirts, some crazy glasses, and peace. Maybe that's what you think. 
Maybe you think of a utopian society, this idea of this place where everything is perfect and everything is as, as we long it to be. A place with no more war, no more bloodshed, no need to lock our doors, no need to walk down dark alleys in fear. Could you imagine a world like that where you could go out into the woods at night and have no fear of lions or tigers or bears, oh my? You could walk down any alley without any fear or risk of your life. This raises another question in my, mind, in my mind. Why should we even desire peace at all? Because it seems to me our general human experience has been one that is without peace. And so the idea that we live in peace, that is the norm, that is the, what we expect, is a world without peace, that there are wars and rumors of wars. From the beginning of time, there has been conflict. It has been the common practice of humans to be at war. Not too long ago, I spoke, uh, I think it's a year or two ago, I guess now, that I, I spoke at a men's retreat, and there I talked about the Vikings. And the Vikings, of course, from Norway, they were notorious for being violent and, and full of conflict. And here was one of the things that was true of them and true of so many of us is this idea that might makes right. And that was, in their sense, their pursuit of peace. If we just dominate, then we will have peace. Other nations live by the same mantra. The idea of humility is certainly something that people would laugh at. The idea that you would humble yourselves before others and extend to them kindness and goodness and favor. And yet somehow in our culture, we have come to expect this idea of peace. So where does this idea of peace come from? C.S. Lewis, I mentioned a few weeks ago, I, sh I shared this quote with you from C.S. Lewis. It talks about creatures are not born with desires unless satisfaction for those desires exist. Then he goes on, if I find in myself a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that I was made for another world. This idea of peace in our world being elusive, what it does is it points this desire within us towards a reality that's outside of our experience, to a world that does not exist here, but one that we long for, another world outside of our own. This world isn't merely a figment of our imagination, but it's the world as God intended it to be. And that, in fact, that's what we saw in the garden, right? That there was this, this desire to be at peace. And in the garden where God created Adam and Eve, there was peace. And they walked in the coolness of the garden in the presence of God. After God created the heavens and earth, on the sixth day he said, it is very good. And everything was as God intended it. This word that we often think of from the Hebrew for peace is the word shalom. It's a common Jewish greeting, right? Shalom, shalom laka, peace to you. And uh, we've heard it, it's equivalent to hello, but it's this idea of completeness, of wholeness, the way things were intended to be, and that's what they found in the garden was this shalom. From a holistic perspective, think of it in who we are as holistic beings, we're physical beings, and in the garden they were well, there was no sickness, there was no death, there was no dying. When we think of it as in our intellect, they were able to be at ease in their mind. Their minds were at ease. They had a peace of mind. When it comes to emotion, there was no anxiety, there was no fear. Socially, relationships were good. Adam and Eve walked together. Spiritually, God was there in the cool of the garden with them. Everything was complete, everything was whole, everything was as God intended it to be, but something happened. Because the experience that we read about in Genesis is not the experience that we experience in our lives today. So what happened? Well, what happened is that sin entered the world. And with, when sin entered the world, there was a loss of peace. 
Adam and Eve were free to eat from any tree in the garden except the one tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For in the day that they ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, in that day they would die. That was God's promise to them. So in the garden we have a picture of peace, but then there was a loss of peace because the serpent comes and the serpent tempts him and the serpent tells him, did God really say, and plants the seed of doubt, did God really say that in the day that you eat it you will die? And Eve replies, not only did he say we shouldn't eat it, we shouldn't even touch it. Of course, God hadn't said that, but she'd begun to put some religious boundaries in there that pushed God's grace a little into the area of works. We don't even touch it. And then they eat of the tree. And then God comes and finds them hiding in the garden because at this point they have experienced shame and shame entered into the world. So no longer was there completeness, peace, shalom of the emotion in the mind. Their minds were no longer at ease. Their hearts were filled with shame. And they tried to cover themselves because they'd been found out or in the hopes of not being found out. I remember as a child, and my mom can attest to that, she's here today, that uh, um, we had some golden Christmas tree bulbs, you know, the ones you hang on the trees, uh, probably some that we have just like those out here. And, and I took one out of the box and I went there and I went, karate chop. <laughs> and then, lest I be found out, I found a little styrofoam ball and I got a golden crayon and I colored it gold and I put it back in the box because I didn't want to be found out. And how silly is it, right? It's nowhere what God intended to be that Adam and Eve should be standing there trying to cover their shame and their guilt. And as foolish as that styrofoam ball looked compared to the golden ball is how foolish their efforts to cover themselves look to God. And God says, hey, where are you guys? Not that he didn't know, but he wants them to come clean. And here's the chance that he gives them. And so they begin to feel shame. But then it goes here. God, the woman you gave me, she made me do this. And then Eve says, Lord, it was the servant, wasn't me. That darn serpent you put in the garden. Whose fault, God? Your fault. So shame enters and blame enters, and we see a breakdown of relationships. A relationship between humans on a horizontal plane and between man and between God on the vertical plane. As a consequence, sin entered the world and the woman would experience pain and childbearing. Her desire would be to rule over the man. The man's work would now become toilsome labor. And in the end, man was sent from the garden, separated from peace and shalom and entering a world of stress and chaos. Death now becomes a reality. So physically, emotionally, Intellectually, socially, spiritually, what was whole and what was complete is now broken and lacking. What had become of the shalom, what has become of that peace? In the New Testament, James goes a little bit further. He says, what causes the fights and quarrels among you? And then he gives an explanation through a rhetorical question. But what he concludes is this. The reason that you have fights and quarrels among you, talking to Christians uh, men and women in the context of Christianity in the church, he says, here's why. It's because you covet, you envy, you quarrel and fight because you don't get your way. We don't get what we want, so it results in quarrels and envy and fights and peace is gone. And over time, things went from order to chaos and continued to go down that broken road from wholeness to brokenness, from abundance to covetousness. We've come a long way from the garden. Our predicament is described for us in Romans chapter 3. It says, it is written, there is no one righteous, no, not even one. There is no one who understands the mind, right? There is no one who seeks God spiritually. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. 
There is no one who does good, not even one. Their throats are open graves, their tongues practice deceit. The poison of vipers is on their lips, their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and misery mark their ways in the way of peace they do not know. So as we moved away from the garden experience of a, of a place of shalom and peace, we've come to this place in a world where peace has not been known. As you know, at this time, there are currently somewhere in the area of 40 wars being fought at this moment. War continues in our world today, and yet this Prince of Peace has entered. And so for many people, they wonder, where is this Prince of Peace? And where is the peace that he's promised? And we've seen the picture of peace in the garden. We've experienced the loss of peace. But where is this restoration of peace? It's been over 2,000 years since this Prince of Peace was born into the world in, in the manger. And wars continue. Will peace, can peace be restored? You know, people thought as we would progress intellectually that peace certainly would be the answer, but that increase in intellect also less led to things such as atomic and nuclear weapons. Gain, gaining smarts does not lead to peace. It's amazing the amount of people who've put their minds to this idea of peace, trying to find peace in the Middle East, but it's continuing to be elusive. So how do we find peace? Where does peace come from? Well, Jesus is our peace. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 14, it says this, well, in the context of Ephesians chapter 2, Paul, the author, is talking about enmity between the Jews and the Gentiles, between those who were considered God's people and those who were on the outside. There were the insiders and the outsiders. And there was enmity, there was bitterness, there was dissent between these two people. And in that context, we read that Jesus came and preached peace to you who were far away. Those who did not know God, who did not have a relationship with God, you who were far from God, God preached peace to you. He also preached it to those of you who were near, those who were part of the Jewish family. They heard the truth of God's word. And then he says, for through him, through Jesus, we both have access to the Father by one spirit. We both have access to God through one spirit, through his death and resurrection. Because of his life and his blood shed for us, we have access to God. And we can have what was enmity, dissent between each other. We can now have peace. Through Jesus, we have access to the Father. The gap has been bridged that kept us from God so we come back again, right? What happened in the garden? That access to God had been taken away when man was kicked out of the garden. But now we have access to God. And the relationship on a horizontal plane that was broken has been restored because you were at enmity, but now you have peace. And how? Through Jesus. The key to moving back to shalom, back to peace, is found in Christ. Not just in Christ in the sense of, not, not just in Christ. We don't just find it in Christ, but by us actually finding ourselves in Christ. So we don't find, there's a very small distinction there. Because we say, well, I could find peace in Christ and we can preach peace in Christ. But it comes here. We have to find peace by being in Christ. So how do we find ourselves in Christ? We find ourselves in Christ by giving our lives over to Jesus Christ, by identifying with Jesus Christ, by surrendering our lives to him and letting his righteousness be credited to our account, the things that he did well and what he did perfectly, we were unable to do because we are sinners, and so we take his righteousness upon us. We basically hide ourselves in him. So we go back to the garden, and in their feeble attempts to try to cover their sins with leaves, God, at that point, provided a sacrifice, and he gave them animal skins. Because in Hebrews, we read, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. But ultimately, we see that in Jesus. When we accept Christ on the cross, and we take his righteousness, we hide in him. 
So when God looks at us, he does not see us for who we are, but he sees Christ for who he is and his grace. But, and through his grace, his righteousness has been put on our account. But it comes by being in him, by surrendering your life to Jesus, by identifying yourself in Christ. To be in Christ means we have accepted his sacrifice as payment for our sins. Let me reiterate what I said before. Without Jesus, we don't know peace. Without Jesus, our lives are marked by bitterness and cursing, by bloodshed and ruin. Our lives are marked by anger, envy, hatred, jealousy, and fits of rage. Unless you have accepted Jesus Christ's sacrifice as payment for your sin, you are God's enemy. Back to the garden. Here we were, God's enemy separated out of the garden. The relationships were broken, envy, bitterness, cursing, all those things. But when you invite Jesus into your life, you hide yourself in Christ and his righteousness is given to you. It means you accept payment for your sins. When you do that, you are no longer God's enemy. And when you do that, you are filled with the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity of God, fully God, who comes into your life. And it says that the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. A stark contrast to this broken nature of envy, bitterness, and selfishness, and all those things that were before. That's life outside of Christ, but inside of Christ you have the Spirit, and relationships are restored, and peace can be found between God and between the people beside you. There's this reality that when you give your life over to Jesus, and in a very real sense, you can have peace right now, even in the midst of of the trials and tribulations in which you find yourself. Even if you are facing persecution to be thrown into the gladiator's arena, even if you are being thrown to the lions or lit on fire, you have friends and relatives, you can find peace. You pursue it and you find it in Jesus. In 1 Peter 3, in 1 Peter 3 chapter 8 through 12, it says this, Finally, all of you be like-minded, be sympathetic, love one another, be compassionate and humble. Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult. On the contrary, repay evil with blessing because to this you were called so that you may inherit a blessing. Now do you see the language of peace in this passage? A place where people are like-minded. Again, talking in the context of Christian believers where people are like-minded, where they are sympathetic towards one another, where they love one another, where they are compassionate and humble. And instead of repaying evil for evil, they're repaying evil for blessing. Now imagine that you are that Christian being persecuted. And Peter is saying, don't curse those who persecute you. Instead, bless them. Well, that's not fair. That's our response, isn't it? Because we want this justice to be meted out against those who deal wrong deal ill towards us. But what does God expect? Vengeance is mine, declares the Lord. And there will be a day when God will come and he will judge. And, and there is that day that that will happen. But that's God's retribution, not ours. We are to offer blessings. Verse goes on, for whoever would love life and see good days must keep their tongue from evil and their lips from deceitful speech. They must turn from evil and do good. They must seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are attentive to their prayer, but the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Really what it's saying is that, 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 we, that God is watching us. And we get this impression, I don't know if you do, at least I do sometimes, when we get this idea, we read this verse, oh, the eyes of the Lord. I remember once, uh, back when I was an intern at Christ Community, somebody was in the habit, I don't know who it was, um, all I know is that every Wednesday night, somebody was stealing candy out of the candy machine at church. Finally, the janitor put a sign on the, uh, on the candy machine, says, the eyes of the Lord Seek to and fro, right? You know, he's, and that's the idea we get the eyes of the Lord are on us. Like, uh-oh, God's watching you. Be careful what you do because God is watching you. 
But that's not what this passage is saying. This passage is saying, hey, God hasn't forgotten you. You who are in the midst of these trials, you who are in the middle of these tribulations, you who find yourself in a hard spot, God is saying, I haven't forgotten you. He's attentive to your prayers. And his face is against those who do evil. So, in other words, there is a day when those who do evil will be judged. So let God judge those people, but you, on the other hand, return a blessing for those who curse you. There is hope for a peace to come. There is a day coming when Jesus will usher in his kingdom and sit upon his throne and rule the world with righteousness. And prior to that, there is a great war in which God will met his justice. The war to end all wars. We've heard that before, right? But this one really is the war to end all wars because God will no longer tolerate evil in this world. The world clings to this idea of tolerance, right? Tolerance is like this peace treaty in our culture that, well, let's just tolerate one another. And let's be honest, it's an intolerant tolerance. I'll tolerate you as long as you believe like me. But they hold on to this hope of tolerance that somehow in tolerating one another, we can live peacefully with one another. But trust me, God will not be mocked. God is a just God who will allow no sin to go unpunished. For those who live in hostility toward God, who live their lives as enemies towards God, who do their own thing, who thumb their nose at God, who look at God and say, God, I don't need any of this. For those people, God will bring judgment. For the rest of those who have trusted in Jesus Christ and put on Christ, living in Christ, accepted his death on the cross for the forgiveness of their sins, God will see Christ's righteousness. For the rest, there will be judgment. Then in the book of Ezekiel, in chapter 34, God gives us a glimpse of what this world might be, a world marked by peace. It speaks of a land without savage beast. When you can sleep in forest in safety. I mean, wouldn't that be awesome just to have a camp out? Hey, let's go have a camp out. We'll just sleep under the stars and not have to worry about what's coming in the darkness of night. The rain will come in season, it says. Trees will yield their fruit and the ground its crops. The people will be secure. Nations will no longer plunder other nations. That's the picture of the the promise of the restoration of peace that comes when God ushers in his kingdom and Jesus sits on his throne. And then in Revelation, it talks about a new heaven and a new earth and this idea of peace will continue where once again we will be in the presence of God, walking in his presence and enjoying his peace. There will be no more sin nor the consequences of sin. We won't have to fear where we walk or who we talk to. There won't be sheltering and protection because we will be secure. God will give us peace. There will be no more anxiety, no more sickness. There will be no more hate, no more envy. You'll be able to sleep without locking your doors. You won't have to worry about death or dying or fear or assault. Your mind will be at ease. See, God's plan is to restore creation back to what Adam and Eve, what God intended for Adam and Eve. God will walk among his people and sin will be more, will, will be no more. So are you longing for peace? I think we all are. There's a peace that can be known both here in the present, in this moment, a peace that surpasses all understanding, right? In Philippians chapter 4, verse 7, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Some of you have experienced that peace. When things were hard, when things were out of control, still you had peace because you had Christ in your life. And you can't understand it. It surpasses understanding. But still, in the midst of those trials, there is peace. You know, it's true what the bumper sticker says. No Jesus, no peace. No Jesus, no peace. N-O, Jesus, no, N-O, peace. K-N-O-W, right? You've seen it? If you've invited Jesus Christ into your life, you know the peace that surpasses understanding. 
And if you're here today and you've never invited Christ into your life, let me encourage you in the midst of trials and tribulations, of broken relationships between you and those beside you and between you and God, the longing for something that you can't have, let me encourage you today to invite Jesus Christ to be the Lord of your life. For those who know Jesus, we are called to be like-minded, to be sympathetic, to love one another, to be compassionate and humble. Let me invite you to be part of that and bring peace in this place as we no longer repay evil with evil or insult with insult, but on the contrary, we repay evil with blessing. I have a guarantee for you. I will offend you. And you will offend me. Not because we're terribly offensive, but because we're human. And though we have Christ, we will sin. The Bible says if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. So there will be times when I say something that will hurt you or you may say something that will hurt me. But we seek peace and we forgive and we are sympathetic and we are like-minded and we, we forgive one another and we move on. And this place needs to be marked by that kind of peace where people say, just as we said, there's hope in this place. There is love in this place. There is peace in this place. And they're saying, I want what they have. But it only happens as we strive, as we pursue peace and make it a reality in this place. So if you don't know Jesus, let me invite you to find the peace of Jesus by inviting him into your life. If you do, let me invite you to be the kind of people who bring peace to the world by the lives that you live. You know, that can extend to your workplace too, right? Blow your boss away that when he tells you to do something you don't want to do, you said, okay. Even when it feels like he might be hazing you or something, you just turn the other cheek and say, okay. It's to the point they say, there's something about you that I wish I had. Let's be people of peace. Let's restore the shalom that God intended in the garden that we can find in this place, a place of wholeness and completeness that's found in Christ. Will you pray with me? Lord, I do pray that we would know the peace of Christ that surpasses all understanding. If there's someone here today that has never invited Jesus Christ into their life, that have hid themselves in Christ, I pray that today they would do that because it's His righteousness, through His righteousness, the death on the cross that w in which He shed His blood for us on our account that we might have forgiveness. So may they invite Jesus into their lives today. For the rest of us, may we be people of peace that we might seek peace, that we might be peacemakers, that we might forgive, that we might turn the other cheek, that we might offer a blessing instead of a curse. That the world may look at us and say, there's something about that that I long for and I desire. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.